Okay, here we go. So this is uh, uh, the spiritual gifts. What lesson is this? Lesson five, right? Right. Lesson Ooh. five. I always try to remember to say that at the beginning when people listen to recording to make sure they're listening to the correct one that they want to hear. So anyway, so good to see everybody. And uh, those of y'all that join us by the recording, you miss so much because we hang out and just love on one another uh, before we hit the recording button here <laughs> and have a good time. So uh, I, I want to get uh, started sort of quick tonight because Rachel uh, has a guest coming over later and she's only going to be able to be here a few minutes. But uh, thank you so much, Rachel, for uh, ducking in. Who is it? Oh, yeah, your sister's coming. And, and I love it when y'all do that. You know, uh, may not be able to stay the whole time, but you come for what time you can. You jump in and, and then you carry on with life. Right. So uh, let me pray for us. And uh, if you have things uh, specifically that you'd like for us to pray for you, and even people uh, in the future days would pray, put it in the chat right there. Uh, if you want to send something directly to me, I haven't covered this lately, but if down in the chat, you can click on right next to the name. It probably says everyone, <clears throat> but you can click on right there and you'll see all of our names. And so if you want to talk behind my back, you can send chats back and forth to each other. Uh, I highly recommend that. And are you can just send one to me if you have something uh, specific. So let's pray together. So, Father, uh, I just thank you uh, for this portion of the body of Christ right here that uh, gathers together in this way at this time. And, Lord, what Lynn said a while ago, I just enjoy it. Look forward to it. Uh, just a gathering. And even the way she said that, Lord, we all look forward to it. There's sometimes where we feel like we'd rather be here, rather be there. But we know that those are especially the times that we need to gather together because this portion of your body will speak life into each one of us. And I thank you for that. Uh, Lord, I do pray that you'll be with Rachel and, and her sisters. They have a time for a visit right here and that it would be a marvelous and a glorious time in you. Uh, Lord, for Lynn and her family, particularly for uh, Jennifer, Father, just be with her. Uh, Father, I pray that you will touch her, that your peace, your joy would reign supreme upon her. Uh, Lord, even what uh, that word, Lord, that you've given me the last couple of weeks out of Micah 7, 7. Micah 7, 7, that says, but as for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation because you hear us, Lord. And I just thank you for that declaration that that's where we are, Lord. And so just be with them as they're just continuing to walk through this time that you have for them. Uh, Lord, uh, everybody else here. I can speak your protection upon them. Uh, Lord, even your healing. We've all got friends that are sick with various things. Uh, Lord, I pray particularly for my mom. Uh, she just had her first chemotherapy session today, folks. And all I know is that she's home and she's okay, but I don't know how it went, et cetera, et cetera. And to do that. And oh, yeah, and Jan's eye. Y'all see that right there? Thank you, Jan. Uh, everybody just join me in this. You know, in, in scripture, we are told, Jesus sent the disciples out, and we're told that we are to go and to heal people. It, you don't see them asking God to heal them. Now, it's not a sin to ask God to heal somebody. Don't hear me wrong on this. But they don't, they don't do that. They go out, and they do it. And, boy, there's something there. And so, Lord, we grab a hold of that for Jan, and we speak your healing by the power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ upon her eye. And at those blood vessels and that whole thing that she was describing to us earlier, this taking place over the last many, many years, <clears throat> Lord, you have complete authority over that. So we just speak that authority. We speak that healing upon her eyes, the very healing power uh, that brought forth the resurrection, Lord, of yourself, that brings forth creation, the same power upon Jan's eyes. Just touch her and that complete, absolute healing uh, to your praise and your glory and your honor. Now, Lord, give us understanding. Teach us, Lord, uh, what you have for us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, Rachel, are you there? And y'all keep praying. Yes, These things right here that Carol just mentioned, by the way, too. Uh, so, I know, we know you got to leave quick. Was there anything in the lesson that you wanted to point out to us or share with us or something that struck your attention or something that irritated you. I had a couple of things that irritated me. <laughs> um, well, in this lesson. I, yes. I'll have confession time. Oh no. 
<laughs> I wasn't able to complete all the homework, so I have to stand in the corner. <laughs> it's, it's the grace and mercy and forgiveness for such. <laughs> but I was um, very interested in the meaning of the word evangelist. Okay. What, what struck your interest about that? Well, um, we've, I think we've really, to me growing up, it was a scary word, right? Because, Why is that? well, um, I was a very shy person and um, we were always strongly encouraged to do the work of an evangelist. And my father was um, the director of open air campaigners, which in New Zealand, they go and stand in sketch boards in the city streets and and sketch out, you know, and, and preach the word. Oh, okay. And they go in, yeah, they go into prisons and they go into schools and beach missions, etc. So as a daughter of an evangelist, I always felt like I had to go out and convert people. But the um, the definition is bringer of good news. Yes. So I can do that. <laughs> Bring some good news. <laughs> yeah. So I thought that was pretty cool. And also the different type of people that you, that to, to bring the good news to is interesting. How's that? Um, the poor, the captives, the blind, the oppressed. Yeah. Did you, so, notice, did you notice how that's repeated throughout the scripture? Yeah. So they need good news. So anything you say is going to be good news, really. So you were sort of set free of some things here then. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's exactly what it means. You know, you're just a messenger. Now, out of my background in the deep south of the states, which is a place that people who live here will tell you that everybody thinks they're saved and all right with God. <clears throat> uh, the evangelist, well, Lynn, you tell me, what was, what's the evangelist in my mindset? The man you invite to come and preach very long sermons five nights a week at church. <laughs> and when he gives the invitation, if people don't come down, he prays hell and brimstone over you until somebody drive, walks down the aisle. That's right. Say. And they, they usually come on the 39th stanza of just as I am. As I am. I mean, it, it's not a, it is not a positive memory as a child and i can honestly say that i dreaded when we invited somebody to come to our church an evangelist to come was it because of the length of the service or the style of the service or just the it, overall the, thing just the overall thing and as a children's minister for 15 years every time an evangelist came i spent the next six months counseling with children who <laughs> They were scared to death, so of course they walked down the aisle. Parents who didn't understand, and I spent six months undoing, I feel like, damage that he did with this style of intimidation to get people to up his numbers so he could say, I've had so-and-so number of people saved yeah, in my yeah. crusades. So just, you know, just the, the terminology and the way I was brought up in my experiences is very negative because I don't necessarily think they were on the up and up. Yeah, a lot weren't. Now, a lot are. I saw them mentioned right here, Kim, you know, Billy Graham, Greg Laurie, that kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's fine. But I remember uh, Billy Graham came to uh, close to where I live, came to Birmingham back in 1971. And if you've never been a part of that, and that was in the heyday of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, it was a very well organized thing. And I remember being 15 years old, went to the local church here. It was actually Northside Church, those of y'all here local. And they trained you on how to be a counselor because we were planning on going down there. And they wanted a lot of people to be counselors, you know, when, when unsaved people came down and they wanted to know about God. And so that's when I found out that a lot of the people that you see walking down the stadium steps that come forward were the counselors, uh, which is pretty easy to detect. They usually had eight pound study Bibles with them you know, and they would come down, not, not all, and it wasn't being deceptive or anything, but it was just different from what 
I thought was going on here. I just didn't know what was happening with that. But we do. We associate certain kind of things and certain kind of messengers um, with stuff. Now, Lynn, you, you touched upon some serious stuff right here, I think, for the body of Christ, because it's something you always struggled with. Uh, when that kind of service or even vacation Bible schools, when you come along, all of a sudden they say, well, 80 kids got saved. And I fear that quite often what we did was they really did not receive the true gospel. They, they, they more like they were inoculated against it. They had just enough understanding. They wanted to get wet with their friends, you know, True. and they could regurgitate some answer that you ask in a certain kind of way that you knew they were going to give you the answer that you taught them to give them the answer but what happened within them. And, uh, and that's where we really need uh, what we're going to get to later in this study, you know, uh, the spiritual gift of discernment, that type of thing. I always hated it when the preacher said, if you love Jesus, raise your hand. Or if you don't want to die and go to hell and you need Jesus, raise your hand. I'd go, oh, because there we go. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, and a lot of times uh, it's, uh, it's very... It, I want to say it was a sincere, ignorant manipulation of the people, but it's a manipulation nonetheless, you know, and, uh, and that's not what you see in the scripture. So much of what we do anyway is not what we see in the scripture. So uh, yeah, Jim is not about yeah. the numbers. Rachel said, yeah, that's why I like to process somebody connecting with God rather than a one-off decision. Uh, <coughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, can somebody be saved in the uh, what we call the sawdust trail of the last 220, 250 years of walking down the aisle? Absolutely. Can people be saved sitting in a catechism class? Absolutely. All that means is you're sitting there, you're learning, you're learning. And somebody says, do you believe this? And you go, you know what? I do believe this. Well, that belief is probably more solid than uh, uh, just an emotional thing that you felt one night because somebody was trying to scare you out of hell, you know? And um, so anyway, there's things for us to uh, consider, which actually goes to something I meant to ask you at the very beginning. I, so y'all be thinking about something. Somebody asked why I go. I think it was Lynn asked me privately what we're going to be doing next after this course, because she's absolutely right. We're, well, this week you'll be halfway through it. And a, a lot of us have to plan in advance what we're going to be doing. And uh, I don't know. I don't know what we're going to be doing next. I do know what I want to do locally. But I don't know how I'm going to do what I want to do locally and what I'm going to be using. And what I want to do, at least locally, we may do it here too. It depends upon what y'all think. I want to do something to where we can continue to study the word and study like we've been studying, not necessarily the same resources. I'm open to totally different resources. But, uh, but something that will help us and doing exactly what you're talking about here, Rachel, that's what brought it back to my mind, of helping to disciple one another, ourselves, the unchurched, the churched, you know, and I, even the word disciple carries connotations, you know, discipleship, that type of thing, that are positive and negative in different people's lives. <laughs> but what could, you know, do that? Yeah, something along that line, whatever that means. Uh, Rachel said it's a spiritual formation course, whatever that is. <laughs> I tell you what, <coughs> I've got one source. I might have given this to y'all before. I'm not sure. I've got a source I'll give you afterwards. I've got the PDF, and it, they said I can use it. It's free, so I'll give it to you. And it's it's actually sort of useful for something like this, but I can't imagine doing it with a class, but maybe so. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, y'all be thinking about that. And thinking is fine, but praying is even better. And, you know, let me know maybe what God is saying to you and what you're thinking about some things, because I am convinced of this. That everybody's wanting to go back to normal. Uh, there's not going to be a normal anymore, folks. Uh, what we consider to be normal uh, is never going to be. And I think it's good. As a matter of fact, I think it's very good. The stuff that we're experiencing now, you've got to, you know, you think, well, this is not good. It's sort of uncomfortable. It's sort of messed this up, messed that up. Well, yep. Guess what? How are you going to look at it? I'm looking at it. Hey, we've got opportunity here. Yes, maybe half the church can't meet corporately like they could in the past in the way they wanted to. Okay, what are you going to do about it? How are we going to continue doing what we've seen in Ephesians 4 right here? How are we going to continue manifesting these five different things that we've looked at so far? We've looked at four of them, of apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, and teacher. How are we going to do that? What are the opportunities here? And then how can we take what we're doing right here and learning right here 
and speaking forth these truths into people's lives and encouraging them to live it out. It's just a lot of really cool things here. And uh, so how does that all tie? I don't know. We'll see as we go along. So Rachel, anything else that you touched upon? I like that evangelist thing. We'll talk a little more about that in a minute, probably. That's it for you. So let's back up real quick then. What have we learned so far? Just tell me about the spiritual empowerment, these things that everybody calls spiritual gifts that I'm trying not to call spiritual gifts. But uh, where do they come from? God. Come from God. And how does God do that? Tell me about the, uh, the uh, how, well, how, how does he do it? Through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit. To who? To those who need that at that. Okay. So uh, all believers. So all believers, and then you're talking about what kind of believers? That's a loaded question, isn't it? True believers. True believers. Yeah. Yeah. True <laughs> believers. If you read any of my writing stuff, you know I use that phrase all the time because there are those that are true believers, and then there's a lot of. Uh, fraudulent believers uh the sad thing is there's a lot of fraudulent believers that think they are in a right relationship with god and i think they sort of make up a large percentage of our church so really the initial ground for us nowadays is the body the professing body of christ because a lot of them aren't really saved but if you're a true believer if you're a true believer then you have the holy spirit and the holy spirit does what see rachel says ones that are accepting god's invitation work with him says in the great yeah so you're a true believer. You repented and confessed and called upon the name of the Lord, and you have been made new. You have a new heart. You've been born again, the coin of phrase out of John. Okay? You have a new heart. You have the Spirit and the Lord. So does God, how much of the Spirit does God give each individual? All of it. All of it. And, folks, that's a biggie, 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 obviously, because I make a big deal about it about it every week, to where a lot of these uh, resources that – we use in all things come up really short uh, because they come along and they say, okay, every believer has how many spiritual gifts? And, and it's always the same thing where everybody has at least one. I'm getting more bold and brazen in my old age here. If you ask me right now, Lynn Ernest, if you ask me what spiritual gifts you have, you know what I'm going to tell you? All of them. I'm going to say all of them. <laughs> of course, that's going to set a fire. Which, you know, I think it's sort of time to throw some hand grenades out there and break up some fallow ground anyway. And, uh, and then explain why. Because if you have all the fullness of the Holy Spirit, which is, folks, the fullness and the totality of the Godhead, think about that for a minute. Is that not crazy? Is that not wild? Is that not the most magnificent thing in the world? That we have the fullness of God dwelling within us. Then why in the world would I ever consider the idea of limiting what he might want to do that's the reason that we're warned not to quench the spirit so every believer has the spirit okay the spirit grants these empowerments and what's the purpose of the empowerments of the spirit through our lives just what do we learn the saints equip the saints for the work build up the church, build up the church for the work the kingdom yeah you're, you're quoting ephesians 4 <laughs> I do have another question about Ephesians 4. You know, in our homework, we looked at Ephesians 4, I yes. guess, every time we get a different gift. But yeah. Okay. I agree that I, and I, I believe, as you have taught, that I do have all of the gifts. God may not be using, but one of the gift at a time in me, but I do have all of them. I have access to all of them. But in Ephesians 4.11, it comes back and tells us that God gave spiritual gifts. God gave some, and then he starts naming them. So I think that's where some of this comes from, is that he gave some. So he gave these this some to be evangelists. He gave this some to be pastor teachers. He gave this some to be on down the line. And I think yes. that's where the confusion comes. Yeah. And, you know, and I, I compound the confusion, okay, and I, I readily acknowledge that. So, uh, and again, in the, in the midst of this, when I'm sharing these things, if you disagree or you run across people that disagree, that's cool, that's fine. This is not stuff that you uh, separate the body over. 
I don't think that these five there in Ephesians 4.11 right here, apostles, prophet, evangelist, the shepherd, and the teacher, I don't think that these are spiritual gifts per se. I think these are spiritually gifted individuals, okay? Spiritually gifted individuals that God uses for what it says in verse 12, for the equipment of the saints, for the work of the service, to the building up of the body. And it goes to what we were talking about last week with the apostling. You know, what is the spiritual gift of apostling? You know, you know, you you can point to teachers and say, well, there's a spiritual gift of teaching. Absolutely. Okay. But I think these are gifted individuals more so than spiritual gifts per se. And I don't think I'm drawing too sharp a line of demarcation and playing with words too much with that. As a matter of fact, I think it sort of sets us free because uh, people that are functioning within these roles right here have the Holy Spirit and have a outpouring of the spirit and a mixture of that gifts of the spirit that is specifically for them what god is wanting to do i like what you said just then michael you said uh lynn about that you have access to the gifts is that what you said yes so they're okay. all available but god only god chooses which one uh to use in me yes. at a given moment or given time could yes be because here's what the thing is <laughs> They, they are available to me, but here's the biggie. They're not under my control, right? Exactly. Because the Spirit grants them. So what is the real question? It's not whether they're available to me. The real question is, have I made myself available to God and His Spirit? That's what I'm saying. It's all based on my obedience. If God yes. is to do one thing and I do it, and I'm, I'm obedient in what He's asking me to do, then He will ask me to do something else. But if I'm not obedient the first time, then that access, he may not give me that access. Yeah. In other words, I have quenched the spirit. And just the way you said that, that popped in my mind. I went, oh my. Yeah, we we do have access, but it's not access from the point of view, like I can turn it on or turn it off whenever I want to. Now, it gets sort of interesting because when you read various commentators, you'll find out that people have divided up all these uh, empowerments and these giftedness in all sorts of different ways. And there's nothing wrong with this because we all love lists. We all love charts. We really do. We all love seeing how things are structured and that kind of thing. And they'll give things. And even some of them, like we saw in First Peter, that they're speaking gifts. If there's a speaking gift, the one has a speaking gift, you uh, speak forth the utterances of God, the oracles of God. Okay. If you have a service gift and you serve within the power of of God. But sometimes I think we get uh, uh, twice too cute with some of these kind of things, you know, and then you find that the people actually just, they start misinterpreting what the scripture says. So they'll come along with these five things right here. And they say, well, these are the five that build up the body of Christ, the prophet, the evangelist, the shepherd, the teacher, the apostle. Okay. They build up the body of Christ. Well, is that what the scripture actually says? Not exactly. Okay. Verse 12 says that they equip the saints for the work of the service to the building up of the body of Christ. And then when you read further along, you find out when the saints do and function as each one is supposed to, right? Every joint, every muscle, every tendon is doing what it's supposed to do. It does what? The end of verse 16 causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Just so much phenomenal stuff right here. So real quick, tell me, uh, the apostle, what did, you, what did we learn that that one, that particular uh, individual does? I'm trying real hard not to say spiritual gift because, you know, what does an apostle do? They go out and apostolize. They, what they, is plow, that? New, they plow new ground. Yeah, a lot of times they are plowing, what's, what's the King James phrase? fallow ground <laughs> what's fallow ground oh i like that rachel fallow ground is ground that has never has had never a, been plowed never been plowed or it's been a long time i've been a long time and so it's never been plowed. but that's that's very much what it is they go out with the message and they are an ambassador and you find out that it's foundational because they are bringing the message. Now, people come along and say, well, what's the difference between that and evangelist and the prophet? Yeah, I, that's the reason I think that we spend a lot of our time, wasting time, spinning wheels, trying to draw real sharp lines between these things. This person, in, in the modern day, people come along and say, well, these are missionaries. Well, yeah, perhaps, you know, you, you can see that. 
but they're taking the message out as an ambassador of the kingdom of God with the gospel message. What about the prophet? What does he do? <coughs> he or she, I'll just step into it with that. Okay. What do they do? You get a word from the Lord. They speak forth the word of the Lord. What'd you say, Jim? Okay. Yeah. They speak forth the word of the Lord. What do you mean by the word of the Lord? Are you, are you meaning? Okay, go ahead. Whoever that was. That was me. I was like, that just means the Lord has spoken to me a message that I need to speak to a specific audience or a specific kind. And okay. I just, okay. Lynn, I'm going to give you an example. I don't know if you even remember this. I, I, I just remember this because it was so funny. Uh, Lynn and I were on a church staff together here locally many, many moons ago, actually uh, 21 years ago. <clears throat> and one day we were in there and uh, Lynn was over the children's. And remember, you were having one of those big fall festival things. It was the first time we were doing that. And you wanted to... Um, get some blow up game things you know bouncy houses mm -hmm. and they sat there as a staff and i think there were eight or ten of us in that room and talked for let's say 30 minutes about whether spending i think it was five hundred dollars four or five hundred dollars that was unbudgeted to get these things i'm just the uh interim music guy sitting over in the corner and i had a little laptop computer and i was actually working on my precept lesson for later that night and they're talking about this stuff back and forth, back and forth. Finally, the pastor, who got, I just love to death, looked at me and said, well, Dale, what are you doing over there? I said, oh, I'm just working on my Bible study. Oh, okay. well, what do you think about this? And I said, uh, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but the business meeting last night, y'all had like $350,000 cash in the bank. And you're sitting here and just worried about $500 because Lynn thinks there's going to be 500 kids here to, to do this thing. Am I missing something? And the pastor looked at me and said, so I gather you're for this. I said, and I'm not for it against it. What are, am I just missing something? And then they decided to go ahead and spend this money on this thing. I think that kind of thing is a prophetic thing because you're bringing exhortation and you're bringing forth the mind and the counsel of God into a situation and a circumstance of guys, you're, you're, you're wasting time here and you're not seeing what the greater issue is if we're going to have four or 500 kids and there's 500 dollars and you've got a third of a million dollars in the bank what in the world are we talking about you know <laughs> and sometimes that prophetic voice will speak rather boldly and sometimes can even be, uh, be interpreted as being harsh uh sometime um yeah lynn you're muted i I wasn't oh. saying anything. Oh, I thought you were. Uh, the reason is your little box lit up yellow right here. And I thought, okay, she was saying something. Um, but anyway, yeah, the, the prophet uh, will also uh, have quite a um, an impact on the local church, you know, like the home church, this kind of thing. But they take the word of God and they speak forth exhortation. They say this thing and they bring forth the mind and the counsel of the Lord here, folks. Carol says, as, as ambassador, bring the good news that God gave through his son, Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Uh, you think there's a need for apostle and prophet today? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a while ago, Rachel gave us great <laughs> insight into the evangelist thing. You actually looked up two words. One of them meant to preach. And the other one means to herald and proclaim. Oh, I got to tell you this. Got to tell you this before you have to leave, Rachel. This is hilarious. <clears throat> Some of y'all might have seen this already. Yeah, it's based on that word angela, so to pronounce something. So my wife is using the spiritual gifts precept book uh, that uh, our third daughter, Lene, used, I think, 17 years ago when we did this course. And so Tomoko just ran across the book in the house. She said, oh, I just use Lene's. Well, it's great because she's seeing what the answer was that my daughter put in there half a life ago. Lene will be, um, I think she'll be 35 here in a few months. Okay. She would also be very embarrassed that you're sharing this. No, she would because we've already shared it all over the internet. She got a kick out of it. Because here's what she said. There's a question that y'all had about 
what's the difference between preach and preaching? Remember that question? And there were some of these questions that were sort of uh, like, what are you asking? You know, that kind of thing. But that's okay because it gets you thinking. Anyway, she made a comment about, uh, and she had a great answer. She dealt with the Greek right here and wrote it out. And, and then she said, preaching is a, a proclamation and a heralding and the standing up and proclaiming the gospel, usually in a tedious manner. It goes back to what you were saying a while ago, Lynn, about what the evangelist was and your upbringing and your mindset. You know, and I'm very proud of it. She was using the word tedious because, you know, we homeschool them and, it's, and you know how that is when they use a word, you know. And so uh, a buddy, oh, Gary, who's usually sometimes here with us, Gary Wiggins, he wrote back to me and said, that's an insightful girl out there. She'll probably wind up marrying a preacher, which is exactly what she did. And of course, I shared that with her preacher husband. <laughs> Yes, that's one of the evangelists. They're usually sharing in a tedious manner. <laughs> that's what preaching is. Yeah, but isn't that sadly what we encounter from time to time? You know, <laughs> so anyway, the the evangelist is the one that goes out and, and proclaims, shares the kingdom of God, shares the gospel message. Uh, and my upbringing is exactly what Lynn said. They were the ones that... Um, went out and you hired them to come in for a week, come in for a weekend. And they were the ones that were supposed to get everybody saved and get them to come in the church. That is not what you see in the scripture. What you see in the scripture, I'm not sure if your screen looks like mine, but if you look right under me and to the right on the names, of prayer, you'll see David Hayes. David Hayes uh, is empowered by the Holy Spirit to be an evangelist. Now, how do I know that? Because it burns within his heart. OK, so I'm going to exhort and build up my brother David here because that's what he loves to do. The people that he just meets out and about as he goes on with life, he'll talk with somebody new and it will be very, very few sentences until he asks them where they stand with the most high God. And he just does it so naturally because it's spiritually and supernaturally empowered. You hear what I'm saying? He's empowered by the spirit to do that. Now, when I talk about him like this, he gets very embarrassed and usually gives me a look to shut up. But he's the example in my life of someone who is an evangelist moving in that way. The example of the, the one of the things we looked at this week of the, of the um, pastor, the shepherding thing is Gary, the guy I was talking about a while ago. Uh, he shepherds and pastors his business like nobody I've ever seen before and the stuff he does with his employees and how he speaks forth uh the things of the kingdom of God and listens to them and prays with them and weeps with them uh literally shepherding this group of people so Lynn would just say one of the men who goes on mission trips and ask that way I say, oh it is when you see somebody that the spirit is moving to evangelize uh what we need to do is we need to realize that God equips and empowers folks to do all these things we've looked at, not just the evangelizing, but everything, and then work in conjunction with one another, okay? <laughs> so David will do that, and somebody is saved. Well, Gary's the same way. <clears throat> somebody is saved, and they'll ask him a question. He may not know the answer to the question. What, what is Gary going to do next? You want to take a wild guess, guys? He did it this weekend twice. He'll call me and say, hey, what about this and this and this and this? You know, and he did a great thing. I told him I was going to share this, so don't fret, because uh, it was just so powerful. He said, I, I shared all this because it was an intense thing with an employee. He said, did I tell him the right thing? And not only did he tell him the right thing, he imparted life to them. Okay. He, he, he imparted the, the life of the kingdom in that shepherding, in that teaching, in even the evangelizing thing that takes place there. So anyway, I, I just think uh, uh, we, we have such vivid examples right here. I'll, I'll give you another example right here. You see the David Hayes right there? You see the Shirley Hayes right there on the screen? They know each other real well. They've been married. How many years have y'all been married now? Anybody want to fess up? They've been married several decades. Uh, and David will do this. He looks to his wife, Shirley, as his Bible answer resource. 
So what do y'all think of that? Is that biblical? <laughs> 61 years. I thought it was 61, but I didn't want to say it because it that sounds like a long time. <laughs> She's my Bible scholar. <laughs> she is. Absolutely. I mean, she is. And it, it's just the most, it's, it is such a microcosm as of an example of how we are supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, Rachel says, not the church of his son and women aren't to teach men. They can't even teach their husbands, huh? I don't know. I think most smart husbands would readily admit that their wives have taught them a couple of things through the years, don't you think? <laughs> yeah. Ours. Just Bible study and and discussing it between the two of us, <coughs> and I explain to him what I think, and yeah. it might be right and might not be right, but we discuss a lot. We sure do. Yes, and my favorite moments in that's when he comes and asks me a question, then he says this. Well, you and my wife say the same thing about this, but I'm just not sure. <laughs> And I love that because you know what? He's sitting there going, God, I'm not sure about this, but they say this and they say this and your word says this, but I, I, I didn't know that. And, and he's mulling it over and he's thinking it over. There's another couple in our life that's the same way, much, much younger, uh, have only been married a brief period of time. And the husband is learning so much because he wasn't raised in the church, doesn't know anything about that, you know, and his wife is just pouring life into him. Yeah. Uh, Rachel says all the rules for an hour and a half that happen on Sunday morning. So silly. Oh gosh, is it not? Is it not? So anyway, you you looked at several scripture passages related to the the evangelizing thing. You saw what well, Rachel's already pointed out her that the Lord is so concerned about the good news coming to the poor, that liberty to those that are captive, right? Uh, being set free from things. That doesn't mean that God doesn't care for those that aren't poor, okay? So just real quick, what was the uh, gospel that Jesus preached? What was the good news? That the kingdom of God was at hand. Was exactly. Good. The kingdom of God is at hand. He actually told that to his 12 that he sent out, that the kingdom of God is at hand. And he pr told the 12 to preach to them and to impart to them uh, healing, setting free of demonic spirits. Yeah, freedom from sin. Yeah. Yeah. yeah That's right. what I was going to say. These examples we read when Jesus sent them out, he didn't send them out just to preach. He sent them to heal, to do miracles, to feed, all those things. So it was not just one charge they were to do it all so what does that say about us that's what we're supposed to be doing it, okay is that what we do i haven't ever healed anybody are you sure i'm pretty darn sure i haven't <laughs> okay okay no i'm just i'm just asking no because it's like well are you sure uh, yeah Usually we don't. Listen to this. Uh, we've started uh, on Sunday morning with a uh, like a Sunday school Bible study class that I do. We started working just through First Thessalonians here the last couple of weeks, and I love this. This is First Thessalonians chapter one, verse two, and Paul saying this: We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers constantly. And there's three things right here: bearing in mind your number one work of faith, number two labor of love, number three steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. Now, here's where I want to go, verse 5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. <clears throat> See, we bring a word, and the word will transform, the word of the gospel, yes. But when Jesus sent forth apostles and he sent forth disciples at all times, you notice they went out and they brought forth the word, but then they brought forth the deed too. Often with signs and wonders, you know, signs, something make, that points toward a direction, a wonder that's something that makes you wonder, you know. We sort of lock in on the word, but we really don't come with any 
Well, here's the big question. Do we come in full conviction? Do we come in the fullness of the Holy Spirit saying, Lord, however you want to release yourself in and through me, do it that this one here will be saved. Do we do that? Uh, Carol says we experienced a healing of a young mother in a small country church 25 years ago. So special brought not only physical healing to her, but a healing of hearts uh, within the congregation. Absolutely. Uh, we had one happen Sunday. Uh, I'll, several of y'all will know uh, a lady named Virginia, and she's on the praise team here. We've prayed for her several times last year because she had to have brain surgery or <clears throat> something. And uh, I didn't understand quite what she was saying. And Sunday in our little class time, she gave us more detail. They operated <clears throat> on uh, her, and uh, and it was successful, and she's recovered from it. She went back this week, and they showed her and said, well, here's what we did before. This is doing very well. <clears throat> Here is the part that we couldn't operate on. They never told her about the part they couldn't operate on. She had a part right there that they could address, and they apparently never told her or the family anybody else that behind that part was something that they couldn't touch. They had the MRIs, the x-rays, whatever there. Here it is. We operated Here's what we could not touch. Here is what we see today. It is totally, absolutely gone. Now, is that not a picture of how God does things? Yeah, God releases wonderful things in medical science, that kind of stuff, and enables us working with him to address an issue. But guess what? There's something we can't touch right here. Then you come back and it's gone because God can touch that. <laughs> I just love that. It's just a picture of just great thing. But do we come, do we live uh, with such a sense of expectation? <clears throat> I think we go back to that Micah 7, 7 thing. Are we watching with such expectation for what the Lord's going to do that we will be his vessel that he can do and release whatever he wants to in and through us to his praise and honor and glory. Now, real quick, uh, who is the one person in the scripture that's actually called an evangelist, which is actually sort of a new word, by the way, that word's only a couple hundred years old. Never. We do. We let we let earthly distractions. Yes. Yes. Philip was one. He was one of the seven. One of the seven. What? <laughs> yeah. What were those seven things? Depends on your background. So one of the seven in the Acts six right there, where there was the problem between the widows, the Hellenistic widows, and yeah, what 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 people bring deacons out of. People say, well, this is where you find deacons. I actually was in a church growing up as a kid, a Baptist church, that only had seven deacons. No, no more, no less, because that's what the scripture said. The word diakonos just means servants, but we've come along and systematized it and created, particularly in Baptist circles, my Baptist brethren here, uh, a board of directors in a lot of churches is what they became, uh, rather than being just servants. But he was just one of those, you know? And uh, but the spirit of the Lord moved upon him mightily. Uh, go back and read that eighth chapter sometimes if you need some encouragement, you know. But you saw that Paul was appointed to be one that went out and preached. Timothy went out. He actually told Timothy later on, hey, go out and do the work of evangelism. <laughs> so they always ask these questions. You know, at the end of the, each one of these things, they say, uh, you know, what is the gift of evangelism? I always answer the same way. I write out, it's not a gift. That's my answer. Uh, and then they ask, do you feel like that you have this thing? Has God ever moved in your life in this way? That's a great question. And that's one to bring before God. Are all of us to witness of the kingdom of God? Yes. Yes, yes, absolutely. All of us are. But there is a spiritual empowerment that God gives to some people to witness in particular kind of ways in particular kind of situations. So that's what the evangelist thing is all about. Now, quickly. You got into this thing of a pastor or teacher, okay? Now, they, they combine them together to where there's four of them, you know, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, shepherd, and they combine pastor, teacher, because they say it's the great line. Some scholars, bye-bye, Rachel. Some scholars believe, you know, that these two should be joined together. Yeah, that's fine. When I hear that kind of stuff, usually it's the scholars that gain some benefit of that. You know, maybe it's the cynical part of me. I don't know. <clears throat> I prefer to handle them all five together. The teacher thing we'll actually look at later. And they said that in the homework. We'll look more at the teacher thing. But what does it mean? And what did you find out about that pastor? What, what does that Greek word mean? Poimen. 
shepherd. To shepherd them. It means to shepherd. It means to tend. It means to herd like you do a flock. And, you know, Jesus used the sheep a lot. Uh, in the deep south where we are, you use chickens because both sheep and chickens are some of the dumbest animals ever created, you know. And you shepherd them, you guide them, and it goes beyond just feeding them. It literally means you take care of them and that you're vigilant in this, okay, that you take care of them and, and you watch over them. Uh, as I mentioned in the last probably two previous episodes, I think the way that we are structured in a lot of our churches has undermined how God wants to use this gift uh, within our body. Okay. Because I think that all of us as believers, I know all of us as believers shepherd at some point in time in some way. If you have children, you shepherd your children. If you have friends, you shepherd your friends. If you have coworkers, you're shepherding your coworkers sometimes just in the way you act and react in a situation. You know, so there's that element of that we all do, but there is a spiritual empowering for the work, for the equipping of the saints. Okay. To do this, Carol says the pastor is uh, to tend the sheep by feeding, nourishing, and growing them up in the Lord where God places them. So that feeding and tending automatically does bring along the teaching thing. And y'all looked up that word, uh, the Greek word is, uh, uh, how do you say that, Lynn? Do you know? Dita scholars? The Daskalos is the way I usually say it, but I don't know. The second one is the way I've always heard it. The Daskalos, yeah. So here's how you handle Greek and Hebrew words. Pronounce it like you really know how you're supposed to do it, and nobody will ever know the difference. Well, I always kind of remember that, that in most languages other than English, that the each syllable has a hard consonant in it. So that makes you make them more distinct instead of us like we blend yeah, ours yeah. together well not not everybody can speak properly like the people in deep south do we we can make trip thongs out of anything you know just to blend everything together so what did you learn about the shepherding thing who is our example of really the uh shepherd <laughs> who's the best shepherd jesus the yeah best shepherd. yeah you saw that word was used usually a lot with jesus and use it as an example with him. What does he do with his sheep? He calls and we answer and follow him. He calls them. We answer. We know his voice. We know his voice. Sheep are like that. They know your voice. Uh, all pets are. Well, except for maybe cats. You know, cats are a whole genre unto themselves. I pick on my cat people here. <clears throat> Yeah, he literally laid down his life for his sheep. He's, he's, uh, he takes care of them regardless of whether, you know, this or that, you know. Now, what we do is, and again, I really think this is probably a little bit of a problem within the body. We sort of exalt one role in functioning uh, to an exclusive position to where it's nearly the point to where it's that person's job to do that. It, whether it be to evangelize, the shepherd, the teach. Oh, yeah, Psalm 23 is just somebody. Who was that? Somebody wrote the great book on Psalm 23 and his shepherd and his sheep, Lynn, uh, years ago. I can't remember the name of it, but it's great. Yeah, he'll watch, the, he'll leave the 99 protected and go after the one. That's what the good shepherd does. That's what he does. And so the thing is, I think that there's far more people that are called to shepherd within the body of Christ than have been released to do so. And they don't really realize what's going on. I love, like, we've, we've got a meeting right now. Okay, this already started. I'm, I'm at in my office at the church building. And there's, there's, a, there's a circle meeting. Y'all know what a circle is? What's a circle? You put your chairs in a circle and you sit and have a meeting. It's a group of precious little ladies down there that are meeting. And you know what? They probably got some food involved with it, and they circle up. And you know what they do? They shepherd one another. They shepherd one and But in our minds, we think that the pastoring, the poiming, is just one particular kind of thing, and it's really, really not. Okay? And when you start looking at this and equipping the saints to realize, yeah, you know what? You have a shepherding call. You have a pastoral call. Being the pastor of a situation doesn't mean you're standing behind the pulpit. 
you know, every one of so Lynn, I'll pick on you because I know you. You pastored and shepherd your children, a son and a daughter, right? Yes. I mean, that's literally what you do. You actually pastor and shepherd uh, your husband. And your husband does likewise with you. Okay. I think it's I think it's a glorious thing. I think it's a wonderful thing. And but to see the tending, the feeding, yes, Kimmy and you. So Jan, you and Kimmy got a thing going here, and it comes out of because you have uh, you're related, right? And everybody goes, well, how are you related? And that's why Kimmy always says, hey, Aunt Jan. <laughs> yeah. You have that relationship. But I tell you what, I think there's a lot more of that to be released. Uh, tell me this real quick as our time's flying by. What did Jesus do with Peter as far as this shepherding thing and this sheep thing? What did y'all see this week? What scripture passage did you look up? This must have been the part of the lesson that everybody First didn't Peter get to. Five. <laughs> Wasn't it, are you talking about first Peter five? No, I'm actually talking about John 21. Oh, okay. I thought you were talking about Peter. So I immediately <laughs> went looking for Peter. Okay. Oh, I, I am talking about Peter. <laughs> 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 That's great. I am talking about Peter. Okay. Jesus was reminding Peter in his way of, of getting, I, almost, I always think that Jesus was saying, okay, Peter, I told you so. You're going to deny me three times. So he asked him three times if he loved him. Yeah, yeah. And that, that is the, uh, a, a picture that's being said here, no doubt. Uh, Peter had denied the Lord three times. And here they are. Jesus is already resurrected it's for his ascension. And they're on the seashore. They go for a walk. Let me just read this to you. John 21, 15. So when they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? There's big debate over what these is. What are the options? And I know we're just jumping into the thing, but what could these be? The other disciples. Fishing. The other disciples. Yeah. Or what else? Fishing. The fish. Yeah. Because remember, he'd gone back fishing. You know, nothing wrong with that. You're earning a living. Okay. He says, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than your vocation right here, these fish? Do you love me more than these disciples? Uh, Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus said to him, what? Shepherd my sheep. And there's a whole thing here with this love, uh, which we talked about in John. Uh, you know I phileo you. He said to him, Jesus said to him, I went out, that was the uh, Second time, I skipped the verse, sorry. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he told him, tend my lambs. He asked him again, and he says, shepherd my sheep. Then verse 17, Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved. And he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. So what's going on here? Uh, he's telling Peter to do something. He's saying, tend these sheep, shepherd these sheep. I forgive you for what you've done. Yes, yes. And don't feel like you have to boil and bluster me because I know you love me. But I want you to know that you're still sort of holding back. And finally, he says what? Lord, you know everything. Remember what Jesus told Peter? He told Peter that he was going to deny him. But then he says, after you've been restored, then lead these folks. And he was talking about the disciples, the apostles. Jesus told him that before Peter denied him. But even in this most intense moment right here, he's telling him to do what? To tend, to feed the sheep. So who tends and feeds the sheep? Now, Lynn, you were saying, well, I go out of first Peter. What did first Peter tell us? What did we find out in first Peter five? That you're supposed to um, shepherd the flock of God that's among you. Who is? All of us. Yeah, but particularly in First Peter five, the first four verses, he, there was a group he mentioned. Right? Do you remember? Anybody remember? Yeah, I didn't write that in my notes. No, you're supposed to memorize it. What are you talking about? I don't know. I'm, I'm looking at my notes to see what I said. 
You, you want me to tell you? Yeah, I reckon it's the shepherd. Shepherd's it's the, the flock. It's, it's the, the elders. Oh, okay. The elders are told the shepherd God's flock. What you actually see in scripture as far as this type of leadership in the corporate church, the corporate gathering, is you see a plurality of leadership. Okay, you see a, a, a group. And they and what they say is the stuff you started to say, Lynn, before I so rudely cut you off. You they did do this very, very yeah, rudely. Yeah, continue um, what you were saying. Um you're not supposed to lord over them. Yes. But you are supposed to um, be in charge. Reward for the shepherd is unfading crown of glory. Ooh. And you're supposed to clothe yourselves in humility. So as you are shepherding, you are to shepherd in humility. You're, yes. So you, it's not an ego trip. And you're not to do it for a sordid gain. Don't you like that? Yeah. See you next week, Carol. Yeah. yeah not for sordid gain. You don't do it for that. You do it voluntarily. You and you set the example with Jesus being the chief, the chief shepherd, that we do likewise. You also find that you know it's these elders that are shepherding. The elders were told they were supposed to uh, be able to teach. There's a tie-in with that. Remember, they shepherd the flock and be able to teach that type of thing. And that, that's really what you see in the uh, equipping of the saints and the leading of the church in a corporate thing. Uh, so that's the reason that, you know, that whole pastor teacher thing, sometimes people want to put it together. Sometimes want to keep it separate and everybody's very cool about it, you know? Okay. Last thing real quick, you look up some passages in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. What did those say about shepherding? I can't remember. That might have been at the end of the lesson. Y'all may not have got to it. I, I did. I'm just looking at it. Jeremiah 17 was, um, you um, don't hurry. How did it say it? It's not to, um, not to shy away from shepherding. That, yes. That it was one of the things. Um, That's a biggie. If the wolf shows up, what are you supposed to do? But take care of it. You don't flee from the flock. You don't run away from it. You know. So what does that say to us? And and, and he he spoke of uh, speaking the truth of God. Uh, there's way too many shepherds that are uh, fleeing from the wolf. Well, when times get tough, they just resign and go to the next church. Uh, well, isn't that the truth? Yeah, Kimmy said, "Don't run away from being a shepherd. Don't be a transgressor against God." Okay. And so in Jeremiah, he gave some very hopeful things. He says, you know, don't, don't, don't turn against God, what y'all are saying, transgress against God. But he promised him, he said, a day is going to come when I'm going to give shepherds that are after my own heart. Okay. They're going to teach them my word. They're going to feed them. Uh, are there people like that today? Yes. Are there people who are not like that today? Yeah, of course. The enemy will only fake that which is real. You know, the enemy seeks to pervert that which is real. So you'll have, you know, fake leaders, you'll have fake shepherds, you'll have fake things like that. Uh, God will deal with them. Okay. He will deal with them. And you but, ask about the Ezekiel passage, and yeah. I, I really like that one. It's that I came away with, um, with the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel. So Ezekiel is prophesying. And basically, he was saying that God's going to deliver you, He's going to judge you, and He's going to restore you. And I found that it was very, I, I really like reading that and all it said. Very, very and, encouraging. Has that occurred yet? Mm, That's a loaded question. So. No, I don't, I don't think, think it has so. either. Uh, the Jewish people, Israel, can receive of that through the Lord Jesus Christ right now. But what he said right there, the restoration of the entire nation and that kind of stuff hasn't occurred yet. No, has yet to occur. I know it is 730, but the other thing is I was doing all this study on the, the pastor teacher role. Yeah. Um, you know, you, I, I look at the pastors that I've served with and, and I use that over a congregation and I see some that they, that you watch them and they were so gifted in that shepherding part. Yes. But they were, they were not very effective in the teaching part. Yep. And then I have known some that are 
some of the best preacher teachers there are, but it's like the shepherding part, either they just are denying that it's part of it, part of them, or you didn't see that, that in them at all. So right. how, if you're going to keep them together as one giftedness or one spiritual, right. uh-huh. um, how do you equate that in those roles of people, the pastors? Yeah, uh, r- really the bigger problem is not even the giftedness of the spirit, it's the governmental organization of our churches to where we create that kind of thing, to where the one, uh, it would be very rare because a situation you and I are probably thinking of uh, would have been a phenomenal situation like this. Someone that has such a shepherding heart, what we would call a pastoral heart, such a heart of love and compassion and mercy and other giftedness of the spirit that we're going to see, that that would be what we would call the senior pastor, the lead pastor, the point guy, the, the, the lead elder is really a better term for all this, that they would be the lead elder, but not necessarily the main pulpiteer or not necessarily the main teacher. We, we had and some of this stuff that I share with y'all folks, I, I know from experience, uh, Jan can tell you this. So in South Florida, we were together in the church and me and my buddy Ron, we were uh, elders at this church. We started this church. This was vocationally what we did. We had two or three other elders that were equal with us, but they had vocationally other jobs. Ron was the main preaching pastor. I was the main worship leader. Ron's one of the best worship leaders I know. I taught all the Bible studies. So how do you think that worked? Yeah, see, there was no ego. There's nothing involved. The other three guys, we had two to three guys, other elders. We would just pray together. We never voted on anything. We would pray about a matter, about a situation, just to see where God would lead us. Sometimes one of them would speak. Quite often, if I'm up there sharing something, I would look back there and I'd go, Rick, you got something to say about this. And Rick might have five minutes of something to say about it. He'd get finished. It would come back to me. And I go, John, do you have something to say about this? And the next thing you know, it's been an hour and a half. And we have been worshiping. And three or four people have spoken and shared. In other words, you set yourself aside and do what God has called you to do. But going back to what Lynn said, so often somebody's got giftings right here. But part of the package deal is, you have to do this or like this. Let's say somebody's very good at shepherding and they're very good at um, uh, uh, preaching and teaching, but they're just not very good at administrative stuff. Lynn, have you known anybody like that? <laughs> I've actually worked with several that were like that. Yes. And that's where it comes along. And God calls somebody like Lynn to come in and help with administrative stuff. Now, starting off, Lynn, you may not have thought that's what, what you were going to be doing. But that's where you wound up at the end of uh, what you were doing with the churches, right? Yes. Yeah. And so was that helpful to those that were not gifted like that? Oh, not only to them, but it's helpful for the church because you don't want to put somebody in charge of administration that is not empowered by the spirit to administrate. It's going to be a train wreck. And so uh, I think there's so much for us to, to learn here and to glean. And then better than that, to start putting into practice, you know, and to start saying, well, Lord, what, you know, what can we do here? What's going on here? We see this giftedness. We see this desire. We see this stuff. What does it really mean to equip the saints for the work of the service and the building up of the kingdom? Anyway, I tell you what, I love this course right here because we can just continue on the next week, continue talking. Uh, our time is up for now. Let me know what you might be thinking about and what the Lord may be laying on your heart for us here in, in this group right here for the uh, the next thing that we look at. You know, uh, could be anything. Who knows? So uh, anyway, hey, Lynn, are you still there? Since I you am. Since I you talked since you talk so much tonight. Uh, Anna, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you didn't. And I love it. I love it. Uh, <laughs> uh, you're very clear tonight, too. Uh, would you pray for us? as we depart this evening. Thank you. Oh, dear precious Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we have been together in this electronic age. Uh, Lord, that it's actually a miracle that we can can meet together like this. And Lord, I thank you for the time that we've had this week studying and learning and Lord, just basking in your, your word and your glory. Father, I thank you for Dale and his leadership. And I pray for you to 
uh, give him some divine knowledge of where to go next and uh, how to lead us. And Father, I thank you for each person here that you would bless them, bless their time of study in the coming week. And Lord, give us an open heart and an open mind to hear what you have to say and not what our traditions or, or, or what we think. Yes. But Lord, teach mm -hmm. us teach us truth. In your precious and holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. Bless y'all. Love you. Love you, Peggy, even though you're hiding back here in the back. Okay. <laughs> we'll see y'all next time. Bye-bye.